Welcome to Proudly Asian, a podcast series that tells bold and proud stories of Asians by Asians. I'm Isabel Wong, a financial journalist who wants to uncover the many Asian stories around us that are waiting to be told. There's never just one way to look at Asians. This podcast will take you through a deep dive into the life stories, struggles and triumphs of young Asians around the world. On today's episode, we have Hitomi Kageyama, a Japanese professional based in Hong Kong who was previously a DJ and performed at large-scale parties for top luxury fashion houses. She'll be speaking with us about growing up in a Japanese household, expectations from the society, and biases against Japanese. Hitomi, welcome to Proudly Asian. I really appreciate that you took the time to speak with us. Thank you so much, Isabel, for having me. It's such an honor to be here today. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> and to um, ease into the conversation today, I have also prepared us uh, some Japanese um, chew high so we could <laughs> have a really casual chat. Um, and for your information, it's peach flavored, my favorite flavor. <laughs> It's mine too. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. And um, well, to, to kick start um, the conversation, Hitomi, um, I would just like to start off with um, a, a question that's specifically about you and your background. I'm just wondering if, if you could just let our, our audience know, like, who are you? What are you? And where did you grow up? <laughs> okay. Um, I was born and raised in Osaka. So I stayed in Osaka up to the graduation from high school. And then I left Japan to study in Toronto. Um, after three years, I moved from Toronto to Hong Kong in 2012. And since then, I have been living in Hong Kong until today. And I currently work in a Hong Kong-based startup company. And I manage a Japanese business department. And I'm also a new mom to a 10-month-old baby girl. <laughs> Oh, so beautiful. So th there's a lot of things to talk about. Like um, I could think of already like questions related to um, how you moved here to Hong Kong and how you find Hong Kong compared to Japan and also your your, your journey of becoming a new mom. But um, first of all, I would like to um, focus a little bit more on um, growing up as a Japanese person. Obviously, for some of our audience, even for myself, I'm not very familiar with um, what it's like growing up in a Japanese household. So could you tell us what is it like growing up Japanese? Um, how was schooling? Um, how are Japanese parents different? How how's how is it different growing up in the Japanese society? Right. So I grew up pretty much in a very average uh, Japanese local Japanese household, and many might think Japanese parents are very strict and they push you to be something good, like study hard. But uh, it wasn't really the case for me. So my parents were like rather relaxed. And for me, it was more about school rules rather than family being strict. There were, there were a lot of rules that, um, that, was, that were kind of like absurd now to think about it, uh, such, a, such as rule that you can't ride by school to school. Um, you must wear white socks. Your hair must be black. If your hair is naturally brown, you have to dye your hair black. Your skirt should not be uh, more than like X, X centimeter above your knees. Um, yeah, a lot of rules when I was in school. And did you break um, any of these rules? Um, yeah, I think so. <laughs> At one point, my skirt was like shorter than <laughs> it should be. <laughs> I am sure every every schoolgirl has gone through that that phase where um they think you know having um, the skirt at the regular length is not cool. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, that that's crazy in terms of um, schooling in Japan because um, you mentioned it quite right. So, like, I would think a lot of the pressure would be coming from your your parents. Like they would have a lot of strict rules. But um, would you say um, the parenting that you got was quite different from um, your friends um, back in the day? Mm, I, I think it could be quite average. Um, but um, yeah, of course, like some of the friends has stricter rules. Like the curfew is earlier in the day, like 6 p.m., where I got my curfew around like 7 p.m., 8 p.m. It de depends on the which age you're in. But um, 
yeah, I, I wouldn't say my parents were that strict compared to others. And I was well in high school or like junior high school, like I was sneaking in. I mean, sorry, sneaking out like time to time. And I'm pretty sure my mom knew because <laughs> she <laughs> might heard the sound, but she didn't say anything. And um, <laughs> back then was was um, dating allowed? <laughs> mm, e- yeah, it wasn't really set specifically whether it was allowed or not. It's sort of like gray zone, but yeah, everyone was dating anyways. <laughs> <laughs> and did you feel, um, I think this is the part also I'm not quite familiar with, like did you feel any tensions between, let's say, like parents, families, between students? Because uh, I think this competition culture w- would be quite common um, between Chinese uh, parents, families, or, or even in, in Korea as well, where um, like different parents would be comparing grades and performance between um, their own kids. And then for the kid who performs better, their family would generally feel a lot better about themselves. So does this happen in Japan? Yeah, it definitely does happen in Japan. But I guess it really depends on where you're from. Like if you're from the urban area, like Tokyo, uh, or like the center of Osaka, where, where the competition is higher, then, yeah, I, I guess you will be under more pressure, like, uh, in, like, school, like, as a student. Mm-hmm. But I was raised in uh, the suburb area of Osaka. And, yeah, I, I yeah, my, my parents were not that passionate in education. And most of my friends back then was all from the same neighborhood. So, yeah, I would say... Those are like very typical, like average Japanese families. Yeah, only a handful will be in really like competitions mm. and go to like like study really hard to get into the best university, best high school. Wow. But yeah, it wasn't really yeah my where where I came from. <laughs> yeah, you you did sound like you you had a relatively um carefree childhood at least from from your parents like you were sort of free from those like really strict and high ex- expectations and um for our audience reference Hitomi still turns out fine <laughs> without <laughs> being the best. So. <laughs> <in school. laughs> and um well, I mean you did mention a little bit about, you know, the competition and um, the community, um, the, the sense of communities within Japan. And um, I think for, for some of us, we, we also noticed that Japanese people are quite community um, driven, very focused on feeling like they belong to a certain community Um which sometimes doesn't give much of a room um, for individuality. So I, I'm wondering if, if it's true for you, like even uh, maybe after your childhood, um, as you were entering, you know, teenage, as you're becoming an adult, um, did you feel that's something that would impact you? Mm, uh, yeah, if I stayed in Japan and um, like went to university in Japan, graduated and just work in a typical Japanese corporate, I think that would have been my case. But um, I chose different paths. Um, I decided to go to Canada to uh, study after high school. And now I'm working for a Hong Kong-based startup company. So my case is a lot different compared to like um, the typical Japanese. Um, I, I feel I can show a lot of individuality without being trapped in a group concept in Hong Kong, which is one of the reasons I like to live in Hong Kong. Um, however... I think Japan is still a community-oriented society, and I think it's. Um, I think the root of this is the the vertical structure of uh, Japan's seniority-based society system, and there are many young people who have strong individuality and outstanding talent, but they are not understood by the people, especially the seniors around them, and they end up being isolated from society. Um, But uh, recently, on the other hand, there are people who are mistreated because they could not adapt to the organization, the the more like um, traditional Japanese big corporates. But once they realized their talent and uh, became independent, they quickly became very successful. Um, And that's the reason why there are a lot of startups in Japan and yeah, um, a lot of independent professionals like working as a um like designer or mm. I see. yeah like tech sectors i wouldn't say misconceptions maybe like common impressions of um you know japanese people or japan would be like japan is is a very tech savvy um place of like high tech and I, I still remember when i was young i would um see segments um that 
would introduce Japan um, and, and the fo- like footage of robots would always show up. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, but um, in, in that sense, you, you mentioned you moved um, to Toronto for university. So did you get questions from your friends or, or, or relatives about like why? Why did you make that decision? Mm, not really, because uh, my... In my high school, I was I, I majored in um, international studies, and I was showing a lot of interest in like learning English and also like oversee music rather than like J-pops. So yeah, I guess my relative kind of saw that was coming. Mm, so that that was sort of like a natural choice. That that's good. At least you didn't get grills for why didn't you go to a Japanese university? But um, but of course, when you moved to Toronto, um, I mean, I'm 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 sure um, even growing up, you would have seen Japanese represented in Western movies or like uh, or, or TV shows. So um, so growing up, when you when you saw representations of like Japanese in Western movies um, by both non Asians or or and Asian communities, um, how did that make you feel? Did you see any of the representations that would make you go like, okay, this is crazy. It's nothing like that. Mm. Yeah, I see I see a lot of like ninja, samurai, geisha, like all those like typical interpretation of Japanese. Um, and in Hollywood movies, I, of- I often see Japanese portrayed as somewhat mysterious people who don't express their emotions well. Or like they're unbeatable. Um, just like the role play by Ken Watanabe in The Last Samurai. Although it's a stereotype perception and it's often exaggerated, I think this is still based on what Japanese people are like in essence. Um, I, I do feel it's true to like some extent that Japanese people are not as outspoken as other nations. Um, and, and the newer image of Japanese people will not spread unless we present something new from our side, saying like, oh, this is what Japan is like now. Um, l- just like how, you know, Korea has BTS and now they're super big and famous in the US and it's kind of changing the image of Korea. Um, but we don't have anything like that mm-hmm. yet. And yeah, I, I, I feel like Japan is too passive in my opinion. Like they don't get mad about being described as, you know, mysterious or like, you know, some sometime like even in like war movies, they describe Japanese as, you know, some some like bad people. Like if, if it's Korea or um China, I think they will complain. Or- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess it is it's true in a sense that I mean the general observation about like Chinese and Korean people, um, compared to Japanese people at the very least, um, Chinese and Koreans are you know, are relatively louder and um, they are more expressive, right? But um, the, the common impression of Japanese people would be they sort of um, remain polite, um, remain graceful and, and, you know, always have that elegant expression, mm. uh, especially among ladies, which um, in, in a sense... Um, I'm sure this will be another episode, another topic, um, which is um, somehow people would, would associate um, people being quiet um, or being not expressive as a sign of vulnerability or weakness. But but um, I'm, I'm sure um, there are a lot of um, studies around at, at least the business world where they are trying to challenge this um, notion as well. But um, this will be another episode. <laughs> okay, that's really interesting. And um, just a quick question. When you first moved to Toronto for university, was there anything that was shocking for, for you or were your classmates very curious about your background? Mm, to be honest, I was really shocked to see Asians fl- being like really fluent in English. Like, Because before I moved to Toronto for study, I had no idea that there are so many Asians actually who are born in Canada, raised in Toronto, speaking like perfect English, like like white Canadians do. Right, right. So that, that was a bit shocking to me at first. <laughs> that that's interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, for a previous episode, we we did mention um a, a lot of the times that like, people would um or Asians at, at the very least um even those who who grew up um outside Asia when they move to Asia or or when they meet other Asians they would get comments 
even um, non-Asians, they would get comments like, oh, you speak good English for an Asian. But then um, their answers were like, well, I, I grew up in an English-speaking country, so why would I not be good at English? So yeah, that's interesting. So after Toronto, you did mention you moved to Hong Kong, but um, you did not plan to move to Hong Kong. You were just um, traveling in the city. Um, but, but how did you eventually stay for more than nine years? Well, I was... At that time, like I didn't have any like set plan in Japan after after Toronto, so I decided to take a month's break to visit Hong Kong because I met a lot of Hong Kongese people when I was in Toronto, and I got interested. And yeah, but before then, I had no idea like how Hong Kong is like, and the image of Hong Kong that I had was all from like the movies with Bruce Lee in it. And very typical image of Hong Kong, like um, the hover, uh, neon sign, and um, the crowded streets. Um, it was supposed to be just another travel destination, but after staying here for a few weeks, I really fell in love with Hong Kong because the city is really vibrant and multicultural. And shortly after, I got a job here and eventually found a husband and... <laughs> started my own family. So Hong Kong has become permanent home for now. Nice. That was a beautiful story. So Hong Kong is home now. But um, of course, most people would think um, it, it's nice living in Japan. Um, but according to you, it's not all roses from a local Japanese perspective. Can you tell us a little bit more about why? Okay. Um, as you could probably imagine, living in Japan as a local Japanese it's quite different from visiting or living in Japan as a foreigner. I feel that there are always unspoken rules in Japanese society, which can be described as common sense. In addition, diversity of thought is not always welcomed in Japan. Um, being opinionated can be perceived as too aggressive or sometimes rude. Um, and as, as expressed in the word, kuki o yomu, that means read the air. It, it means like read between the lines. I feel suffocated by like Japan's unique culture of sensing the mood of the moment and understanding and fulfilling unspoken demands, especially in business setting. Um, yeah, so, so that's one thing. And also it's difficult for women to continue building their careers after childbirth. Compared to other developed countries, the rate of women's participation in society in Japan is relatively low. The reason for this is that working for a company in Japan involves long working hours and it's making it difficult to balance work with childbirth and childcare. Um, on the other hand, in Hong Kong, it's very common to hire a living helper, which is very helpful. Um, and I like how practical things are in Hong Kong. Like you, you basically can outsource anything as long as you pay for it. And it was very smooth for me to return to work after giving birth as well. Mm -hmm. And and you're, you're probably like welcomed by your colleagues and there were no questions asked in terms of why you, you still continue working um, after giving birth, right? Because it's quite common in, in Hong Kong. Yeah, and I think in Hong Kong, it's expected, like women are expected to continue working and there is a system for it, mm -hmm. which is, you know, aligned with what I want. Yeah, another way to look at it is probably just rent in Hong Kong is too expensive. So <laughs> the wife has to work right. after giving birth as well, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, but it worked out well for me because I wanted to build, continue building my career and I didn't want to give up just because I became a mom. Mm. No, I want to have both worlds if possible. But in Japan, like we have limited options and even like nurseries, it's really hard to get in these days like especially if you live in Tokyo or like city of Osaka I see so um you did mention a little bit about how Japanese people are expected to read between the lines especially in the business settings and and especially for women um they might have to sort of sense or, or know when it's their time to to speak right so uh, I'm just curious for example um if um a, a Japanese woman really makes the mistake of maybe speaking during a time that, you know, people are not expecting her to speak, what will be the consequences? Mm, I guess it depends on the, the situation, but, um, and also the degree of mistake. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, in general, like there is a atmosphere where, well, especially in business world, like if it's between friends, it's different. But in business setting, like um, I feel like I have to give a lot of thought before I speak up because I don't know, it, it could affect negatively or like, I, I, I don't know, I will care about how people think of, about me. Like in Japanese society, like we, de- we definitely like care a lot about how we look like from others. And yeah, I, I think that's less of a case if you live in uh, Hong Kong, because Hong Kong is very diverse and there are a lot of different people from like different countries and um, yeah. they accept each other. I, I don't know if they accept each other, but they <laughs> don't really, you know, care what other people yeah. are doing and, you know, it's their business. And But, but, <laughs> but what about um, if it's a foreigner um, in Japan? For example, let's say um, if one day I move to Japan and, and work in, in a company and I speak, you know, I, I voice my opinion um, without thinking um, if it's an appropriate time to do it or, or I voice my opinion during a time that maybe Japanese people think is not appropriate. What do you think will happen to, to a foreigner if they do that? Well, I think as long as you're a foreigner and you only speak Japanese, like um, if you just speak English, then you will be in an international environment and the setting is quite different from a traditional Japanese once so yeah it, nothing nothing bad will happen it's it's the same as like uh wherever it is in the world mm. like you know. so so normally the comment would just like oh it's just her being a foreigner <laughs> is it true <laughs> <laughs> or like well the traditional japanese people might not even understand mm, i see that's so, interesting. Yeah, you'll, you'll be excused. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's good to know. I can get away with anything <laughs> except <laughs> crimes, of course, in Japan. <laughs> but um, but yeah, you did mention a little bit about um the difference between Hong Kong and Japan. But I would like to know um after you moved to Hong Kong, um, and now that you've lived here for for over nine years, what do you see is the biggest difference between Hong Kong and Japan? Um. There are so many differences, and well, the first thing I can say is the level of noise on the public transport. It's really noisy in Hong Kong, but which is actually helpful for me, like especially if I want to go out with the baby, because baby might be fussy or like cry sometimes, and people in Hong Kong are like generally nice to babies, and yeah, it, it's loud to begin with, so I don't really have to feel bad <laughs> about you know baby like crying in public but in japan like sometime um if you're in the train and it's very quiet and if your baby started crying they will look at you and i don't know i just and feel like, like you know take being care judged. of your baby <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> or like educate your baby to be quiet in the public <laughs> yeah they, they won't be actively like helping me mm. yeah i i feel Hong Kong, in Hong Kong, like, yeah, people are nice yeah. with a baby, nicer with a baby. It's and, true, because mm-hmm. normally when they see, like, a heavily pregnant woman um, most of the time, or if they see uh, families with, with child, most of the people would just give up their seats um, for, for pregnant ladies or, or families. So, um, but does this happen in Japan also? Mm. I think it happens in Osaka, but not sure about Tokyo. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I didn't expect that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in Tokyo, people are too busy. I see. Yeah, it, it does just give out the vibes that, you know, they're just too busy to care about others. Wow. I mean, of course, not everyone is like that, but it's just a yeah, general feeling that yeah, I get. Yeah, I guess like foreigners <laughs> might say um, something differently because um, obviously uh, foreigners, for example, um, especially um, Caucasians, um, it, when they travel to Japan, they often would describe the experiences of like Japanese people being ex- you know, exceptionally helpful. Like even in Tokyo, um, there you know, stories such as like Japanese people going out of their way, you know, buying the train tickets for them and taking them to the actual platform and, and, and eventually travel to to the station um, with them um, despite they were not traveling in that direction. These are some common stories among um, foreigners, but it was sort of shocking to hear from you that, okay, like Tokyo people would, would not have time or w- w- would not be as helpful, you know, to Japanese people um, since they're too busy. But um, 
but I mean, here's a question for you, a little bit on the identity side. Um, now that you've lived in Hong Kong for more than nine years, right? Um, what do you see yourself as? Um, of course, Hong Kong has been a big part of your life, and and is essentially it's home to you at this moment. Do you see yourself as Japanese and still an outsider in Hong Kong or a Hong Konger? Hmm. Okay, of course I'm Japanese at my core, but after living here for so many years, um, I would say my position now is in between an outsider and a Hong Konger. Mm. Um, yeah, but I, I feel like I can never be a true Hong Konger unless I master Cantonese. <laughs> um, and living in Hong Kong as a Japanese person does feel like being a guest sometimes, which... It's excuse for not speaking the local language and uh, sort of free from obligation to the country. Mm. And so yeah. essentially you, you get away with things living in Hong Kong as a Japanese now. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> exactly like what will happen to you if you live in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Um, yeah, and, and especially um, Hong Kongers are generally very curious about Japanese people for you know, I mean, I, I still don't entirely know the reason why, um, but but I mean, I know the the general observation is like Hong Kong guys are very, um, they they have a fantasy or they are obsessed <laughs> with Japanese people. So you would even hear some Hong Kong guys saying like, "Oh, I need to find a Japanese wife," <laughs> or um, a lot of Hong Kongers are also um, big fans of anime, um, well, J-pop, not. Not so much these days because they're mm-hmm. sort of um, drawn by K-pop. But right. um, I think J-pop was quite popular for, for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a lot to do with the, the culture, like pop culture in Japan. And also um, Japanese women are like known to be attentive and mm. caring. Is it true? <laughs> um, to some extent, it's true. And... Yeah, I, I try to be caring. I try to live up to the expectation as well. <laughs> wow, lucky to be your husband. <laughs> but, um, well, the other thing that um, when I first met you, um, of course, we, we met through work. Um, but one aspect about you that really surprised me um, in a very pleasant way was that you you used to work as a DJ. I mean, despite your day job, for a significant part of your life, you you also had a pretty cool night job, and um, you basically performed for brands such as you know Dior, Montclair, Balmain, and more, and at some of the top bars and venues with breathtaking view in Hong Kong and Macau. So, how did it all start for you? Okay, um, I started DJing when I was in Osaka. When I was in junior high school, I was listening to hip hop and R and B and wow. I got really interested in um like US music. And then one day I saw a female DJ playing in the, the background of a music video of my favorite artist. And she looked really, really cool with with her hat on. She doesn't show her face, but she looked really, really cool. I'm like, wow. And soon after I bought my first turntables and headphones with the the money I made from a part-time job when I was in high school. And yeah, that's how I started. And yeah, that was yeah definitely the most expensive purchase I made back then. Wow. And would you say female DJs are common um, in Japan? Mm, yeah, when I started, the, the, there were a lot of female DJs just starting as well. Mm-hmm. And then... I think it became even more common later because, um, so when I started, it was all analog. I used to buy vinyls, like a real like record instead of CD or USB. Mm -hmm. But then later, um, the trend kind of switched to like using laptop for DJing and it it made every like easy for everyone to start. And then I think, yeah, there, there are more and more people who wanted to be a DJ after that. Wow. And um, I know that um, I got the permission from Hitomi to play, you know, a short snippet of her her tracks. Um, So with that, why don't we listen to some of the works um, Hitomi has done previously?
was a really nice music break. Wow, I really enjoyed the track. Thank Now, you. Now, he told me more questions for you, um, for your DJ career. Um, I mean, you you started pretty early. Um, but did you ever get any questions from your friends and your family about why you decided to become a DJ? Mm, not really, because everyone knew that I was into music since like junior high school, and um, and the DJ wasn't really like full time job anyway. So yeah, it was part of my hobby, like mm. hobby slash like passion, mm. and. Yeah, I I didn't really get questions because mm. they're already aware that I love music and yeah, and that's part of the reason like I wanted to go to you know North America because that's where all the music were coming from, all the music that I was listening to like hip hop and R and B or like mainly from. The states, right? The the reason why I was asking that question was, um, I I could already imagine if it was like, um, you know, if it was like a Chinese mom, um, let's say if I took my mom, I decided to become a DJ. I think the first um, comment I could envision, I would be getting is that, um, music doesn't make money, or why don't you go for classical music? <laughs> <laughs> so this is why I was very curious if you got um, any comments about your choice. Hmm, I see. But yeah, I didn't put it as like, oh, I'm gonna make living as a DJ. I just put it as like, oh, I'm I'm gonna DJ as a hobby. So But you you made a pretty successful career for yourself. Like you performed for a lot of top brands in the world. It's oh, so cool. Thank you. Only <laughs> only after. I moved to Hong Kong. Like, yeah, I didn't really take up much gigs when I was in Japan or Toronto. Mm. Um, yeah, because I was yeah um, busy doing other stuff. But mm. yeah, I, I think it's relatively easy for me to pick up gigs in Hong Kong because there are a lot of bars, clubs in Hong Kong. That's and, true. Yeah, it, it's quite easy to get connected with other DJs too because the community is really small and. Um, it's it's very open to outsider too because everyone is pretty much from elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it was easy for me to get into the community. Whereas like in Japan or Canada, there are a lot of like local resident DJs, and it's sort of like hard to break into the community. Like you have to like actually get to know everyone and get introduced to like the organizer of the party. Like it takes. A long time for you to get a job, but in Hong Kong it was easier because there are there are a lot of demands as well. Yeah, I, I think you just mentioned another. You know, the, the beauty of Hong Kong being it's it's so easy to get connected. It's such a small place, and also it is a lot easier to get things um going because people in general come from a lot of places here in Hong Kong. They gather mm-hmm. together and um they are a little bit more open minded in a sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. think so. That that's yeah one of the reasons I like Hong Kong. Like in Japan or Canada, I see a lot of locals just um, hanging out with locals only, mm. and the community is kind of closed yeah. and exclusive, and it's kind of hard for outsider to mm. you know break in. But um, I do know that you have been taking a break from your DJ career. Why is that? Mm, oh, that's because. You know, now I'm a new mother, and most gigs happen late at night, and it's really difficult to keep up when I have a baby and also a full time job. And yeah, I'm because of COVID, like there are less demands in in town, anyways. Um, it just so happened that you know, like I got pregnant at the same time, and uh, frankly, also I feel less passionate about music uh, since I have my. Uh, many other new interests <laughs> as I grow older, and I strongly believe in the quote: "Do it with passion or not at all." Mm. So I'm not planning a comeback at the moment, but mm. I'm open to get back on the decks for a casual, fun, relaxing event such as private parties. Mm, nice. So, um, well. Our audience um, take note. Uh, <laughs> Hitomi is open to to play in private parties. <laughs> um, yeah, I do. I do. I mean, I've never seen you um, DJ pers- in person myself, so I do look forward to maybe one day if you make a um, special comeback, I'll definitely be there. <laughs> But um, do do you miss um, DJing sometimes? Yeah, sometimes. Um, just a couple of weeks ago from now, uh, there was a gig. Um, one of my friends was. Playing in the bar, and then 
I was there and she she said, oh, why don't you jump in for like 15 minutes or so? And then, yeah, I was freestyling on the on the decks and it was so much fun. No. Uh, <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, for a second, I forgot that. I, I'm a mummy now. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what would you say if, for someone who 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 is considering um, a career in DJ or even just, you know, trying to work as a DJ professionally, what do you think would be the most important qualities that person has to have? Mm. Besides being able to take a lot of um, drinks. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you definitely need to be genuinely passionate about music. Like you have to like really love what you're doing and I think the place you're living is also important because I feel like living in Hong Kong um there are like music lovers but most people just just go for like typical like party music like mainstream I would say that music scene is very uh mainstream and they just want to like get drunk and have party but uh, if you go to like Japan or I don't know let's say like North America Europe I feel like there are more people that are actually, you know, um, listening to music and knows a lot of different type of genre. Mm. And yeah, if, especially if you want to succeed as a DJ or music producer, I think um, the city that they live in is also important because you can, you know, naturally get to know other great DJs in the scene. That's true. Yeah. I mean, the, the music crowd is very important. And I, I guess it, the same could be said um, for a lot of creative professionals, even in, in the domains of like art, um, uh, movies, um, or any other multimedia format. Um, but um, another new job I would like to talk about, because, you know, obviously, you have a new job as a new mom. Um, so, of course, I would like to talk about Asian parenting with you <laughs> because um, just, you know, Asian parenting is, is, is a world famous parenting style that everyone um, knows about. And some of the common um, stereotypes about Asian parenting would be, you know, um, being a tiger mom and, and some research papers would, would say um, Asian parenting emphasizes interdependence, um, conformity and emotional self-control. What do you think of these um, um, Asian parenting traits? Um, in the family I grew up in, my parents were not that passionate in education, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so I had a relatively liberal policy in my family. and But looking back, I wish they had given me more guidance. And it may be an exaggeration to say that a child's future is determined by the way their parents educate them, but I do think at least it has an impact on the environment and also community that uh, they are raised, in, in which they are raised. And yeah, I, I don't want to be a tiger mom, but um, I do want to look ahead to some extent and make sure my daughter has a good foundation to start so that she has more options to do the things she, want, she wants to do in the future. Mm. And um, your daughter Mia is um, is is going to be one year old soon, right? Mm -hmm. and, so fast. Um, I know. Yeah, I, I still remember meeting her a, as a newborn. Um, but um, so far, how would you describe your parenting style? Well, the good thing about living in Hong Kong is having a living helper, and I have to admit, like I, well, because I also work as a full timer. Um, I still kind of struggle every Sunday because that's when helpers are out. <laughs> right. But yeah, I, I'm very much enjoying the process and yeah, I really appreciate that, you know, um, I'm able to you know, continue with my career and also being able to work from home. Mm. It, it means a lot that I'm able to see like my daughter, like growing up, like very closely are you discovering any um, talents of, of Mia so far? <laughs> She's really a go-getter. Like yeah. once she sets her mind, she will do anything to like go get it. <laughs> does she enjoy her music? Yeah, she actually does. So when I play like upbeat music, she she knows like how to groove to the beats. 
Yeah, she definitely loves music. Nice. And、um, the other question I would like to ask is that、um, for for Japanese culture,、um, as an outsider, I do observe there are a lot of traditions within the Japanese culture. So. Are there any traditions that you're looking to preserve to continue with your daughter?、Mm, yeah, I guess. Well, it's it's the same for like any Asian parenting style, but、uh, learning to play the piano from a young age is. <laughs>、uh, it, I, I was also learning a piano, and it could be one of the reason why I fell in love with the music.、Mm. So I would definitely want my daughter to learn the piano as well. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I mean that's that's exactly the the thing that I wish I could do. I, I never took any piano lessons. Now, I'm I'm so regressing it because、um, I I do feel now as an adult I do feel music is an outlet for me to sort of like express, you know, any of my stress or or、mm-hmm. you know some you know when when whenever I feel stuck that would be a domain that would be really helpful. So. Yeah,、um, I think you, you you got it right. Like she she needs her、um, piano lessons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in fact, I'm starting to give her now. Like <laughs> I have a small keyboard、nice. at home. And、um, well, that was nice. But it's time now for rapid fires. So in this segment, I'll be asking my guests、um, biased questions, as they have got asked at some point in life, and also some common biased questions Asians get asked a lot as well. So Hitomi, are you ready? Do you need a few more sips of、um, Shuhai? <laughs> Let's have a few. Yeah.、Here. Let's have a few more. Although my cup is empty now. <laughs> okay, we need to refill the cup. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, great. We're ready. <laughs> We're ready. <laughs> All right. First question: Are you Chinese? Um, my ancestor could be Chinese, but I am Japanese, and I do speak a little bit of Chinese. Hiya, hiya, le ho ma. And Japanese people can read and speak Chinese, also, right? Yeah, actually, yeah, we can. But some things that don't really make sense, so. Yeah, it takes a lot of,、um, I mean, practice or like experiencing like ordering food in Chinese places, Chinese restaurants. But yeah, I can sort of guess the meaning of it. Do you eat sushi every day? I wish I do, but sushi in Japan is for special occasion. I, I know a lot of people think we eat sushi every day, but、uh, we do eat Japanese style like home cooked meal, but we don't really. Eat sushi every day, and we don't really make sushi at home. And do you wear a kimono every day? <laughs>、um, that would be really interesting if I wear a kimono every day to go to office. <laughs> wow, you speak good English for a Japanese person. I do have mixed feeling when I hear this.、Um, I want people to know that it's not necessarily a compliment. <laughs> And Japanese girls are shy and obedient, right?、Mm, I think they are shy, more shy than、uh, Western girls for sure. But <laughs> yeah, we could be bold too. And Japanese people are so polite.、Um, it, it's good to hear that you know people think we're polite. So let's just keep it that way. <laughs> and all Japanese people work hard. Yeah, that also I want people to see us as hardworking people. And all Japanese people hide their true feelings at all time. Ah,、uh, yes and no. <laughs> It depends on the the relationship with the people. Like we could be really outspoken with like close friends or like family or spouses. And do you eat KFC during Christmas? Yes, we do. Thanks to the the brainwashing TV commercial. <laughs> <laughs> That was really fun. Yeah, I love your response, <laughs> <Same> Tommy. <laughs> Thank you for doing rapid fires with us.、Um, and to wrap up the episode,、um, I just want to leave this question for for you and also for our audience who might happen to be Japanese.、Um, to you, what, what does it mean to be proudly Japanese? Right. I think it's a basic state of mind rather than something that I make a big statement about. There are things that I am proud of. About Japan, and also I am ashamed of. The phrase "proudly Japanese" sounds like an overstatement in humble and humility culture of Japan. I am not quite sure if I can say I'm proudly Japanese, but 
what I can say is that I'm happy and content to be Japanese. Nice. And、um, I mean, being happy is, is all that matters in life as well. Well, thank you very much, Hitomi, for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you so much for having me again, Isabel. It was really nice、uh, chatting with you this way. That's it for this episode of Proudly Asian. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at proudly.asian for more content. We are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. Thanks for tuning in. Signing off for now, I'm Isabel Wong. <laughs>